We have just an amazing amount. I don't know if you even remember because you've been through probably a rough, long week, what we talked about last week, but we were talking about the last Passover. And before I go any further, I want to finish something out. What was interesting, if you remember our references, in case you didn't write them down, Matthew 26, 2 through 29, and then you can read about it in, in, in the, la- the last Passover in Mark 14, you can read about it in Luke 22, and you can read about it in 1 Corinthians 11. Okay, those are your places. But what's interesting is the three references from Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all in the middle. They're not New Testament. They're in the mixing time between old and new, right? The real church age account is in 1 Corinthians 11, delivered by Apostle Paul, and he says it was given to him. If you read it, you will see it. He says, for I have shared with you what I received from the Lord. He didn't hear it from the apostles when he was in the wilderness and Jesus took him into visions and taught him the gospel. That's where he got it from. So understand when you hear that, that's why there's a difference. You see Peter, James, and John, and you read those books in the New Testament. They, they tend to be a lot more, more work-oriented. You're right, they do. When you read, when you read James, you read 1 John sometimes, you see a lot more work-oriented. You see Peter, it's a lot more work-oriented. Let's talk about why so we can understand. We just get that out in the open so it's not like a 600-pound pink elephant sitting in the corner, right? The truth is, guys, they did not get a spiritual revelation of the gospel. Their gospel came from watching Jesus. The problem they had was at the, at the time Jesus was teaching them gospel, he was also having to walk out the law. So it would have been natural for them learning as they did to, to mix the two. So you, you get that, but you, that's why you look at Paul. That's why he was given you know, pretty much a lot. Let's just say a lot because nobody wants to narrow it down because some of the book's authorship are still, you know. But let's say he, he has a lot of the New Testament. And the reason is his gospel didn't come from a fleshy eyewitness account. His gospel was given by revelation from Jesus Christ. And it was purely spiritual. That's why he speaks so much on a higher level about spiritual things than they can. And that's why when Peter came and, and he would eat with, it, with the people in the Gentile churches until people came from the Jerusalem church. And then he, he segregated himself like a good Jew, like a good Hebrew, and he wouldn't eat with them anymore. And Paul took a front of that. He said, are you saying now that you're going to be made whole by the law after being saved by grace? And he called him to account in front of everybody. And the reason he did it, obviously, because he did it in front of everybody. So it needed to be corrected in front of everybody. And of course, Peter, Peter realized that he was wrong. He realized that he was wrong. And I'm sure he made repentance. I mean, we know he did because it's, he, he continued in grace, right? Amen? But so you can see the difference and you can understand why there's a difference. Guys, we're not perfect. Sometimes we read the Bible, we think the apostles were perfect. They weren't. They were people like you, like me. They were chosen for a certain time, but they were still people like you and me, and they still could only do what they could understand. They still could only understand what they could see and hear, you you see. They didn't have a vision with Jesus Christ for three years in Arabia and, and breaking down these spiritual truths. They didn't have that. So the whole time they're trying to learn grace, they're also keeping law because he's keeping law. So he can be the fulfillment of the law, amen? So to them, they were in this mixture time. Which is why when you read the Gospels, you have to have those glasses on. You have to put those glasses on, those grace glasses, and understand. A lot of times, it sounds like Jesus is telling you to do things that are more like law things. You've got to realize, why was he saying them? He's pointing to when he goes to the cross. He's not there yet. So the law, he's saying, hey, what, I'll tell you one that's abused a lot, in my opinion, and I'll share this with you. Be ye holy as I am holy. Right? Yeah, all right. Be ye holy as I am holy. Now think about that. Why would he say that? First of all, nobody could. You don't think he knew that? Why would he say it? He's pointing you to your need for him, folks. He's pointing you to your need for him. I'm not saying he doesn't want you to be as holy as you can. But that's not what he said. He didn't say be as holy and pure as you can. 
which the word really would be pure for us because holiness only comes from the Lord. You can't be holy. <laughs> you can be pure. You can do your best to be what you should be. Amen. But he knew you can't be holy as he is holy. You can't. So what's the point? When you realize you can't, you realize you need him. He's pointing you to the cross. But people want to bring that back in under grace and say, well, we got to be holy as he is holy. Well, first of all, you can't. <laughs> and second of all, he's what's holy about you because he's in you. When you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Here's a principle that the law taught, folks, and it wasn't about cups and it wasn't about what water or wine you put in it. Okay, you got to get past that. When you put something holy in a, in, a, in a plain common vessel, you know what the law says? The, the vessel becomes holy. Hello, it's not talking about a dumb cup. It's talking about you. When the Holy Spirit indwells you, you, the vessel, become holy, fit for use. Amen? Does that make sense? Sure. So your holiness comes from Jesus. Now, you should purify yourself. John talks about that in 1 John. He said, everybody who has this testimony in, in themselves purifies themselves. And you do. You consider yourself dead to sin, and you don't yield yourself willingly to sin, do you? No, because Paul said that. Do not yield your members to sin. He didn't say you'd be perfect, though, because he, he knows. But, he, but what's the difference? Don't yield yourself. Fight the good fight. Work out your salvation. Amen? That makes sense? Don't yield your members to sin. Don't just give in and say, oh, well, there's grace. No. You should do your best to be pure for a good testimony unto the Lord. Right? For a good testimony. Because by your good works, they know who you are. Amen? They know what Jesus is about when they see what his people are about. If his people match up as best they can to the way he looks. If he's the image of God, you're the image of him. If he's the image of God, you're the image of him. You know, there's at least three places in the Bible, right, where it says for Jesus is the sole expression of the glory of God. The effulgence, it says, is the word in King James, of the glory of God, right? And then he says, and guess what? You're the image of me because you're my body, right? He was the light. Now he's indwelled you and you're the light. So I just wanted to make sure we, we, we notice that. So when we see the first Corinthians passage, we're getting the spiritual guy telling us what he got. Amen. So you get the three eyewitness accounts, so to speak, or secondhand eyewitness accounts. You understand what I'm saying? They just saw this. Some of them ate it, right? Paul never saw Jesus on Passover night, the last Passover. He wasn't there. He wasn't, he, he, he wasn't even grown. He didn't see it. So for him to say in 1 Corinthians 11, what I've shared with you is what I received directly from the Lord. He's not telling you he saw it because he was sitting there. He's telling you he saw it because when he was in Arabia, the Lord took him up in visions and showed him what happened and explained why it happened. Now think about this. The other guys, they didn't get that kind of download. They saw it. They experienced it. And it does say that Jesus opened their minds to the scripture. But you don't have any indication that he went over every bit in peace and gave them the spiritual knowledge. For he had not even ascended yet when that happened. Not permanently. You understand? Right? But here's Apostle Paul who gets it all from Jesus by the Holy Spirit, spiritually. He gets the understanding behind it. He gets the understanding behind it. Amen. So it's different. So it's neat that we have that one included. That's the one most churches model when they have Lord's Supper. It's interesting. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but it's just interesting. Okay? So that being said, what is interesting, and you can't undo this when you get there, Paul's account, that account, never mentions Passover. Go read it yourself. Never, not a word about a Passover. He, you know what he started calling it? Because he learned it from the Lord? The Lord's Supper. Passover's done away with. Because Passover's happened. Passover is Jesus Christ on that cross. And the resurrection by his blood that releases and causes us to be passed over in judgment. 
There ain't no need to talk about it anymore. Now you just take communion with the Lord. You're in Passover. So now it's Lord's Supper. And that's why, that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 that he received from the Lord, every time you take this, do it in remembrance of me. Now, what is that? Not remembrance in what was before. He said, every time you eat this supper now, he's changing the supper. You remember me telling you there were two suppers in one? Jesus took Passover. He participated in Passover with his, with his disciples, with the 12. He ate, they ate. He didn't even prepare it. There was nothing to it. Anybody could prepare Passover, right? But not anybody could prepare Lord's Supper. Only he could. And that's why symbolically, in, when the meal was kind of getting towards middle to the end, he stood up and changed everything. It says he stood up. They had already eaten. So what's he doing? The bread's already broken, right? They've been eating for a while. And all of a sudden, he changes covenants changes covenants in the middle of the last Passover. He stood up. He said, I know you guys have been eating, but we're about to eat something different. We've been eating this for thousands of years and it hadn't kept us from death. I mean, he took bread and it says, he broke it. He broke it. Right? And then what did he do? He passed it. He didn't eat. He broke it for everybody else. You see, he went to the cross. He didn't eat of it. You understand? It was him given for us. So he didn't participate other than to break it. Amen? So he breaks it, hands it out. And what does he tell them? You eat. And I want you to catch what he said. I will not eat again or drink again until what? Till what? Until the kingdom, that's right. But there's a very important word that he used. He said, I will not eat again of this bread. And he also said drink in passages until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven. It is fulfilled. You know what? It is the real Passover. His death and resurrection. He knew that he was the Passover lamb. He said, I'll not eat or drink of this again until it is fulfilled. You know what that means when something's fulfilled, right? How many of you keep paying bills after you've fulfilled them? You keep going. Y'all keep sending money. You get a statement that says, oh, you're fulfilled. You're done. You don't do it, do you? You don't even talk about that bill anymore, do you? No, you go on to what you got that's new. When Jesus Christ looks at you and says, when I eat next time, it's going to be fulfilled. You don't talk about that anymore. You move over into Lord's Supper and you start eating the new bread and drinking the new wine in communion with his new life. Amen. Does that make sense? It's just as obvious as anything, isn't it? He changed it right in the middle. By the way, he did eat and drink when he, after he was resurrected, just so you know. Remember what he said? They, they didn't believe it was him. He said, do you have any food? He ate some fish and he drank something too. Yeah. And here's the other thing you got to understand. People say, well, it's still Passover, right? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not mad with anybody. I just want to tell you the truth. It doesn't matter about Passover anymore because that was the Passover and now we're in Lord's Supper. How do you know? Well, if it was still Passover, then when he said, every time you break this bread, do it in remembrance of me, it would have been only on Passover, right? That would have been the time because he said every time, every time you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So if it was still Passover, it would be once a year on Passover, right? Well, just what? Three days later, Jesus broke bread again because on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him and they begged him to stay at the inn with them. You know the story. And he kept telling them he was sharing. Shouldn't, he said, shouldn't, the, shouldn't Messiah have had to die like it said about him in the scriptures, you know, right? And they didn't recognize him, even though he was giving them all this good information. All of a sudden, they sat down to eat, and he took the bread and broke it. And how they noticed him? They recognized him in the breaking of bread. See, it, he meant every time you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Passover's gone. You're in, you're in Christ now. Every time you eat, every time you drink, do it in remembrance of him. Why? Because the life you live comes from him now. You owe him everything. It's not once a year. It's not once a month. I'm not saying you have to go through this ceremonial thing, and he didn't say it either. You know what he said? Every time you do it, remember me. Remember my sacrifice, because I'm your Passover. 
See, and by the way, he was already doing this, just so you know. Breaking of bread has nothing to do with that Passover because he broke bread to feed the 5,000. See, the breaking of bread was something that you can only associate with Jesus Christ. You understand that? This is new. It's different. It's unique. It's fresh. It didn't exist before. It's not something from the old just reshaped and brought into the new. This is so unique. It's so new. It's from heaven. The other was from the earth. Amen? That celebratory Passover all those years, what did that do? Yeah, that's all it did. It was practice. And what do you do when you practice something? What do they say? If you, I remember I used to play tennis. They said, hey, if you really want to be good, you hit that same shot so many times you don't have to think about it anymore. That inside-out shot I always had trouble with because you bend the ball. You hit spin on it, and it bends out and lands right on the corner. And you hit it, and you bend it out. You just bend it out, and you have to think about it. But after about 1,000 of them, you don't think about it anymore. You just hit it, and it does what it's supposed to do, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? When you're God and you're dealing with people that aren't spiritual, you know what you do? You have them practice, 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 practice till they can't get it wrong. Because what you're hoping for is they keep looking, they keep thinking, they keep thinking, they think da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and then when it comes, they'll see it. What was so sad about it is the leaders didn't see it, but the common people did. The common people lined the streets of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They knew he was Messiah. The only people denying it were the leaders. Right? What did he warn us about? The leaven of the leaders. <laughs> the leaven that says, he can't be Christ. We got to do it this way. Right? You know what he said? Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What was their leaven? The hypocrisy that Christ is standing right in front of you. And you think it has to be something else. I, I'm, not, I'm not making that up. The Bible says there are two accounts that say what the leaven was in, in the Gospels. Out of the four, there are t two. One time it says that the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees was their doctrine. The other time it says it was their hypocrisy. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll, we'll transition, but I want to give you one more thing about bread. I'm going to give you one more thing about bread. I want you to just think about this for a minute. And the reason I would do this, because I've noticed now, I had an opportunity to go to a place where they had a lot of Christian books, and it really shocked me and it broke my heart how many Christian books are taking people back to the law. And they're not necessarily taking them back to the law f per se for salvation, but what they say is you got Jesus, and now you want to keep the law to get blessed, Right? And I feel sorry for my Lord because it's like he gave his life and people want to just take that flippantly and then they think they need to add to what he's done to get some dumb blessing here on the earth. And they really just, without realizing it, they don't know, they're just kind of doing like that, just slapping him in the face, you know, because he provided the ultimate sacrifice. He is the Passover that sets free. And people take that and then they think they need to add to it. You know, it's just sad. It's sad. And... um so I wanted to share this with you, and this will make sense to you when you think about it, okay? In Exodus 12, we should probably go there. Let's look at it, Exodus 12. Exodus 12. Because Moses, Moses is speaking. Well, actually, first Exodus 12, Exodus 12, 1, the Lord is speaking to Moses and Aaron. And it's funny because you get his account and then they turn around and exactly what he told them, they say to the people. So you get their account. So you get God's account to Aaron and Moses. Then they turn around and Moses says the same thing back to the people. You get it twice. All right. But I, I, I would like for you to see just something here. Um, well, there, there, there are several things, but we're, we're talking about bread and only bread. Um, so, I, I want you to see, uh, look at verse 15, Exodus 12, 15. I don't really have this written down. We're just kind of, we're kind of going right now, okay? So, seven days you shall eat, what? Unleavened bread. On the first day, what? You shall remove leaven from your houses. Listen to this. Whoever eats leavened bread... From the first day of Passover until the seventh day, 
that person will be cut off. Let me get real with you for a minute. I wish I had some bread. Just get real with me just a minute. Let's just be honest. You believe God's love? He says he is, right? How much would I love you if I said, hey, Bill, look, we love each other, right? Here's the deal. For seven days, don't you eat any leavened bread. If I catch you eating any leavened bread in seven days, I'm going to kill you. You're going to be cut off. How ridiculous would that be? What bread he eats. I mean, let's be real. How ridiculous is that? I'll kill you over bread, man. Don't you eat leavened bread. If you do what I tell you not to do, you're cut off. Somebody said it. Obviously, symbolism. Right? Obviously, it's as if you're dealing with a child and you need to imprint something and use an example that they can handle. Right? It's almost like a parable. <gasps> It's almost like a parable. It's almost like you took a people that didn't have the spiritual aptitude to understand and you're doing your best to point them to a thing that they'll be able to recognize through the repetition. It's almost like that. Because surely a loving God wouldn't murder you over bread. That's ridiculous. Right? You know it is. Now, you take that little snippet of information... And think about Jesus. What did he teach? Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Is he talking about bread? No. So Passover was just something to point people towards leaven. You need to remove leaven from your life if you're going to be under Passover. Now, what we know is, who's the real Passover? And how do you get in and take a part of Passover? Through Jesus. Let me tell you the truth. Once you're in Passover, you better not go after the leaven of the Pharisees, or you'll release grace and go back under law, which kills. You'll be cut off. It's as obvious as anything you've ever seen. The leaven of the Pharisees will kill you if you're trying to live under grace because the leaven and hypocrisy of the Pharisees is that you've got to add to the work of Christ. Once you come under Passover, you're free. Why would you need to worry about anything else? This is why he taught them to remove leaven. What's well, seven? It's perfection. It's the time of the church, folks. Seven days, the week of the church. The year, if you will, or the week Jesus spoke of in Luke 4 when he said, I've come to proclaim the glorious year of the Lord, the year or week when his favor rests. The year of the church. Amen? The New Testament. Any time in the New Testament, if you've come under Passover through Christ, you cannot break with that and bring leaven back into your life. If you do, you will be cut off. Apostle Paul said it this way. If you get circumcised, you will have fallen from grace. That don't mean physically. That means if you trust circumcision for your salvation instead of Christ. See, it's all through, it's woven throughout Scripture everywhere you go. Guys, you can't slap Jesus in the face like that. He did it. There ain't nothing you can add to it. There's nothing you can add to it. You either believe and trust in him or you don't. And that's how serious it is. Anybody that brings leaven back in. Remember what leaven is? The teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Their doctrine. Washings. Ceremonies. Feasts. Days. Months. It's written all throughout the Bible everywhere. Paul was all about it. Why'd he write most of it? Because he's the one that got the spiritual revelation of the gospel without having to watch it practice out. Amen? It makes perfect sense. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. I mean, can literally, can you imagine? God's saying, hey, don't eat any leaven for seven days, I'm going to kill you. 
It's obviously pointing to something else. Now, if you think about it, people don't get this a lot of times. And it's not preached a lot, maybe, at least where I've been, it's not. Maybe preached a lot of other places, I don't know. But let me just say this. There's a little snippet of information about John the Baptist, about, any, about Jesus' teaching of John the Baptist. You know what's interesting, what he says? Jesus says something that's so revelational, and it just goes, whew, if you don't catch it, because you're so busy reading, oh, I'm finding out about John the Baptist, you know? And so if you're not open you can miss the little snippet he puts in there at the first of it. When, when uh, John's disciples come to Jesus and say, John wants to know if you're the one or if there's another that's coming. You remember that part, right? All right, let me, let me say this. Jesus slides something in, and if we don't get it, we'll miss it. This is what he says. He tells us what the law really is. He says, the law and the prophets prophesied until John. You know what the law was? It's nothing more than a prophecy. The reason they had to keep the rote things of the law was because they weren't spiritual and it would emblazon in them to look for these type of things, the bread. Now, how Jesus came and what he fulfilled them, he said, I'm the bread. I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread from heaven. Your fathers didn't eat the bread from heaven. That was manna. They died. I'm the bread of life. See, he was fulfilling every prophecy of the law pointing to, he was Passover. That's why Jesus came and he said, hey, in two days is Passover and the son of man is going to be given up. Why? Because he knew I'm the Passover. It's been pointing to me this whole time, thousands of years, right? It's been pointing to me. He was telling them. And had they allowed those things to really mean something instead of making them a death or life thing and burdening people, if they had just gone through it openly and realized it was pointing to him who was to come, they would have known it. And a lot of them did, but they were the rank and file people that figured it out. You know? (laughs) They were the rank and file people that figured it out. You better kick that leaven out of your house or you'll be cut off. Now, in case you don't believe that, remember the prophecy of Moses when he prophesied about Jesus? I don't have it in front of me, but it goes something like this. You can look it up yourself. Towards the end of Moses' life, he got this prophecy and he said, the Lord has shown me that he's going to raise up someone like me from among you. And when he said someone like me, he meant a mediator of a covenant because see, Moses mediated a covenant. That tells you that Jesus didn't just superimpose some kind of spiritual stuff on the first covenant. Jesus mediated a new covenant. He came after Moses. And this is what Moses testified of his successor. This is what he said. He said, he's going to come and he's going to tell you the word of God. Now that's funny because John 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the word became man. The word became flesh. That's Jesus. See, Moses prophesied this, prophesied all this. And so every word Jesus spoke was greater than that which had been spoken before because you know what Moses' prophecy was? And he's going to tell you what God wants you to do. And you guys, if you don't believe that, if you don't think that everybody knew that and they had been taught that, then just think about the woman at the well. Jesus walked up and he was talking to her and he said, you know, such and such, such and such about something new. And what was her first word? I know that one is to come, one that will tell us what we should do. See, she knew it. She knew. She knew to be looking for the one that was to come who will tell us what we are to do. And Jesus said, he who you speak of, I'm he. I am the successor that can take you really where God wants to go, that will tell you really what God said. Amen. That makes sense? That's what Moses said. Here he was, standing there in the flesh, the bread of life. Amen. Isn't that something? Everything, every prophecy, it all pointed to him. Everything pointed to him. And he went about fulfilling them. But that's what he said, right? He said, I'll not eat again of the bread of this covenant or drink again of the wine of this covenant until it is fulfilled in my father's kingdom. Now, see, Jesus tripped people up because they don't know how to look at him, right? And he said, you think I come to do away with the law and the prophets? That's what he told them. He said, I didn't, right? He said, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law until what? 
all has been fulfilled. That's why Paul teaches that Jesus is the end of the law for those who believe and only those who believe. If you don't believe in Christ, you're still under the law. Not a jot or tittle has passed away. But if you're in Christ, you're released. Because in Christ, all has been fulfilled. Jesus said, I'll not eat of it again until it's been fulfilled. Know this for sure. The new covenant or the, the, the closing out of the covenant of the law was fulfilled when Jesus was on that cross. You know how you know? Because Jesus said it. He looked up at the Father and he said, it is finished. That was it. All was fulfilled. Now, how do you know God's real? How do you know he'll come through with his promise? Because Jesus had to die first in trust. And he didn't raise himself. The Holy Ghost came and raised him. That's how you know God will do it for you. He's already done it. If you're in Christ, he's already raised Christ. That's your guarantee. He's called the first fruits of our salvation. Right? Amen. He is surely going to resurrect everybody who's in Christ just as he's done Christ. That's why Paul said, let me tell you, you preachers who say there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, then there's no salvation. You're still in your sins. Because just as sure as he died, God raised him and, re and, by the way, did away with all that sin that was put on him, all of yours and mine. He paid the price for it and it's dealt with. Amen? Isn't that true? You know it's true. When you hear it, you know in your spirit it's true. If you're born again, you know. Because it's testifying. Amen? It's testifying, isn't it? Luke twenty two fifteen. We'll get on track. Luke twenty two fifteen. We're back in this Passover thing. Let's look at it. This is what Jesus said. Um, it's amazing stuff. Um, look at what he says here. He's talking to the 12. I, want to make, I don't know why that's a big deal, but it seems to be that the Spirit always tells me to tell it. Remember, it's not 150 disciples that are there. This is Jesus and the 12. It's them. Okay. And he's sitting there, and in verse 15 it says, He told them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Can you imagine the strength they're trying to convey in English when he says, With fervent desire, I have desired? You don't even talk like that much. I mean, we rarely ever talk. We have to really be trying to overemphasize, don't we, to say, with fervent desire, I've desired. But that's the connotation here. I have been passionately desiring to eat this Passover. And you understand that word? He didn't say the Passover. Catch that. He didn't say, I have fervently desired to eat the Passover. You know why? Because people have been eating the Passover since Moses' day. He didn't fervently desire to eat the one last year that he ate with them. He didn't fervently desire to eat the one two years ago that he ate with them. You with me? Why fervent, tremendous zeal and desire to eat this Passover? Because this is the Passover and all the ones before were prophecies because look at what he says I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer because I'm the Lamb of God who gives his life for the sins of the world I am Passover and this is what it's been pointing to all these years you see where he was I've been fervently waiting to get to this one. Because after this one, it's Lord's Supper. After this one, everybody who's in me is set free from the written commands. Amen. Isn't that amazing? No doubt everything's changing. <laughs> Can you hear that? No doubt everything's changing. And that's when he says, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it. I'll no longer eat of these Passover deals. That's it. I'm not eating the bread and the wine anymore. 
until it's fulfilled. You notice that's what he says, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. When something's fulfilled, folks, you don't keep building it every year. It's done. And when you hear a man who's the son of God, who's the lamb of the world, and he goes to the cross and he said, it is finished, that's the fulfillment. Amen. Can you hear it? I can then he took a cup and gave thanks. He said, take this, divide it among yourselves. He didn't take any for himself. Because <laughs> this is his blood poured out for us. He didn't need to drink it. <laughs> this is his body broken for us. He didn't need to eat it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yep. Divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. What? Until the kingdom of God comes. Now I want to ask you, do you remember? Do you remember what, what was so unique about John the Baptist? Just think about it. Let the Spirit move you right now. The Holy Spirit. Not any Spirit. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. What was so unique about John the Baptist? What was, his, what was his preaching, you know? You remember? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. You don't have much time. Repent. You can get in on the kingdom of God. Repent. The kingdom of God is his hand. And John preached that until he was beheaded. And Jesus took over. That day he was beheaded, Jesus started preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And here's Jesus saying, This Passover is about to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is about to be at hand. Amen new birth in the kingdom of God is now at hand for anybody who believes. Amen. <laughs> the blessing of God the Father Almighty is on the people who are in his kingdom. They're seated at his table. Amen. Isn't this, great? This, is, this is amazing. In the spirit, they're seated already at his table. Amen. Partakers of this, the rich word of God who came and walked and showed us what it looked like. Jesus himself, the word, you know, amen. So this is about all we need to talk about. Let's finish it up. He took bread, gave thanks, and what? Broke it. <laughs> Broke it. This bread is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Not in remembrance of what was before. Because I'm it. See, you don't add anything to Christ. You see, he didn't say do this and do everything else. From now on, do this in remembrance of me. Right? Amen. Likewise, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And of course, they drank it also. Make sense? Isn't he good? God is so good. So, anytime you try to get tripped up, because there are a lot of books out there about these kind of things, just remember one thing. Just remember this one thing. You really think God's going to kill you over bread? If you ever get that low that you feel like it's that important to take physical leaven or whatever, I, do, I, want, I just want you to understand something. Just understand this. David ate the showbread. King David ate the showbreads on the table. God did not kill him over bread. But he would have. But David had something called grace. David already had a revelation of grace before his time. You know? Jesus even referenced that later on. When they were walking, the leaven of, and the doctrine of the Pharisees was so strong. Right? His guys on a Sabbath were walking, picking grain, just picking it to eat it because they were hungry. And they said, they can't do that. That's work. It's the Sabbath. You're unclean. The whole lot of you, right? <laughs> Jesus, you know he laughed. He said, man, come on, get real. David ate the showbread out of the, out of the tabernacle. <laughs> he didn't get killed. Don't you know that? He said, let me show you one other thing. 
just so you'll know. He said, I don't work for Sabbath. Sabbath works for me. He said, come on, guys. Really? You really think it's in the bread? He said, Sabbath is for you. You're not for Sabbath, right? See, they had changed everything where the rule ruled the people. Instead of understanding that God made men and everything else was made for us. Amen? Amen. You know it says it in Hebrews 2. What does it say? For he hath put all things under his feet, that man. What is a man that God would be thinking about him, right? That God would consider him. For he hath put all things under his feet. But we don't yet see all things under his feet, but we do see Jesus, who's the pattern of a man with all things under his feet, right? Amen. So let's just take that blessing today. And when you eat, I'm not, I don't care how you take communion, how you take Lord's Supper, but I just suggest this to people. When you sit down to eat, you break that bread, Thank you for your body, Jesus. When you take your first drink, it won't hurt to thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. This is what he said in 1 Corinthians 11. Do this every time you do it in remembrance of me. Right? Remembrance of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lord, who came from heaven and gave himself to set you free and bless you. 